Welcome to The Dennis Report. I'm Dennis Acheson. Have you ever noticed, conspicuous by its absence, when conversations about the economy occur in the media, with politicians, with business people, how often not mentioned is farming? Our provincial identity was built on three Fs, forestry, fishing, and farming. So how is it that that piece of our narrative, that piece of our identity, is not part of the common conversation that goes on when we talk about how to build a better province. Today's guests are going to start that narrative for us and hopefully it will carry on with your input and comments on the YouTube channel. So please listen for how food, farming and food security are key elements to the future of New Brunswick. Amanda Wildman is the Executive Director and Ted Wiggins is the President of the National Farmers Union in New Brunswick. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks, Dennis. And we were warming up, having a good time, and we're just going to pick up from there. Uh, recently, legislation, attempt at legislation and in the legislature didn't work on food security. Can you give us some of the backstory about why it's important and maybe why they couldn't pass it? <laughs> you can start and I'll kick in. <laughs> All right. There goes the first hour. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there was a bill introduced in February called Bill 11, a local food security act. Mm. And it was a fairly succinct document. It was about 11 pages. And it was based off of best practices already found and implemented in other jurisdictions. Mm. Um, and so a lot of research has gone into this field in the past and how uh, food security can positively impact communities, livelihoods, and the health of the province. Yeah. Can, huh? can I cut in just a bit? Sure. A lot of people, food security, huh? Food, so food security means from where to where? From the farm to the table, from? Conveniently, I brought a definition. <laughs> so uh, this is from the United Nations Food and Agriculture uh, Organization, the FAO. Good. And um, food security exists when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food, which meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. Household food security is the application of this concept to the family level with individuals within households as the focus of concern. So that is the underpinning for the audience. And that was to be the discussion in the legislature and the momentum behind the proposed legislation. That would be part of it, but there's also, a, a, from a farm, farmer's point of view, there's a, a, a major economic component as well, because food security is premised to a large degree on local production, mm -hmm. rather than uh, importing everything you need. Mm -hmm. And that has a major impact on the family farm and on the economy as a whole, uh, and all the let's say the secondary industries that go along with it, such as processing and equipment maintenance and uh, purchase and so on. And mm -hmm. when we were chatting before the show, um, you said you're a farmer. Yes. How, how big is your farm? How big is your shop? I'm a small farmer. Uh, for uh, the past 23 years, we've uh, sold organic, uh, certified organic vegetables in uh, the Boyce Market in Fredericton and also in St. Andrews. Mm. And for quite a bit longer than that, we've also produced uh, uh, primarily lamb as well and uh, this year we're, we're still producing lamb and some beef but the uh, market garden I'm getting a little older now so I'm slowing down a little <laughs> bit and uh, we're, we're producing garlic but the primary focus of production now is lamb. Yeah. Okay and can you give a quick o overview some of the homework and prep for the show there was a time when New Brunswick had a fair number of um, small farms and family farms and that number has dwindled I have stats from 10 years ago so well, 1500 down to three or four hundred well, there, there's more than that, but it's okay. but it has well. It's interesting. I think, uh, I guess I'm interested in the area of, of uh, sheep production. But at one time, the province had, I don't know, 140, 150,000 sheep, maybe more, mm -hmm. uh, probably around 1900, and we're down to probably four, five, six thousand sheep in the province. Goodness. So it shows you the contraction. Good, and then that would tie to legislation that would help um, entrench and make a focus or a philosophy or a nurturing of the soul of a whole system that would nurture the province. Yeah, so like Ted mentioned that, and 
like you both commented, that definition of food security is fairly limited. So a group of folks decided to expand upon that, and it was led um, part, in part by La Via Campesina, which is one of the NFU's um, partner, international partner organizations. We were a founding organization for their body, and that moves, expands to food sovereignty. So even though this bill that was before the legislature was called a Local Food Security Act, yes. it really bordered on food sovereignty, and food sovereignty encompasses the right of farmers and citizens to have control over their food supply and mm. their design their own food system. Um, and so this legislation really brought forth um, a lot of benefits for our local farmers, but the number one, well, one of the benefits I think for farmers would also be that we, young folks would see that there's easier access to markets, therefore making it a more interesting career choice. Mm. Yeah, if, you, if you look at the average age of farmers in the province, it's continually climbing. I think yep. it's up around 55 or 56 I think years 55, old now. 55, yeah. Mm. And uh, um, if that trend doesn't change at some point, we're going to run out of farmers. Um, the, the number of farmers will say under 35 is, is very small. But I will say that uh, when we have a, um, an NFU meeting or whatever, I'm surprised at how many young people do have that, that participate or turn out for it, Great. which is, a, I guess, a positive step. Mm -hmm. Do you have an idea what would turn that? Would a Food Security Act help turn that so more young people come? Because built in there is an awareness that they can get access to this as a, a career? I think a lot of people, a lot of young people, would like to be able to farm and have that kind of a, 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 lifestyle. a occupation, lifestyle, yeah. whatever. Um, but to farm, you've got to be able to make a living at it. You, and you don't want to be in a position where you have to do off-farm employment to subsidize the farm. Because mm -hmm. that's not fair to you, it's not fair to your family. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think there's an interest there, and if people can make it work, they'll do it, and they'll, they'll put the hours in too. Is the crux of that um, not having large enough markets to sell their product to because New Brunswick's population is too small? Or is it because of some other factors that get in the way of that? It's not a problem of population because right now we import more food than we, uh, than we produce. Uh, the problem is a lack of marketing opportunities, but it doesn't mean there's not a market. It's just a lack of opportunity, uh, the centralized buying, um, mm. You've only got two large or major grocery chains now, and most of that single desk buying, they, they don't want to buy from a number of small farmers. They want to be able to buy from one operator. Yeah, more efficient that way. Yeah. So do you have thoughts to, uh, well, where do you want to go next? Because there must be a, there's a thousand things that just hover in behind that kind of claim. So do you want to go back to the legislation and, and talk about... Uh, was it frustrating to watch? Because I know you rallied, you had a bunch of people at the legislature and, and you're watching something that connects to your fate and it also ties to everyone in the province because well, food connects all of yeah. us. I, I guess from my point of view, what was frustrating was that the cost of a local food security program versus the benefits that we could realize from it were so minimal. Mm -hmm. In other words, for a relatively small amount of money, um, uh, I think we could have had a uh, major impact on the New Brunswick economy, especially on, on rural New Brunswick. And rural mm -hmm. New Brunswick right now is, you know, you're constantly hearing about the threat of school closures and yes. uh, hospital closures and so on. Um, if we want to maintain rural New Brunswick and not waste that infrastructure, we've got a lot of land out there. Do we want it sitting idle and earning no uh, income at all? Or, or do you want to have something happening out there which uh, will add to the economy, allow people to stay in, you know, small communities? And I think we could have done something with that for relatively little money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think one important element about the legislation and one of the kind of arguments that government was using to refuse it was saying that we're putting the cart before the horse that we need to have research before we can have <laughs> legislation. Um, but in reading the bill, it clearly sets out provisions to establish interdepartmental cooperation and another steering committee and things like that. Um, and one of the first provisions was to do the baseline research so that we would know exactly how many carrots or how, like, we would have that research so that when we're setting targets, we're not saying all hospitals need to import 100% of their food next week, because mm. reality is we, that's not possible. But let's set a target for within the next five years, everyone's eating 10%, buying 10% local food, or uh, especially on the major contracts. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it was really a progressive. It was really just setting the 
pieces in place so that further action could be taken. Whereas supposedly further action is going to continue happening on mm -hmm. food security, but there's no framework yet announced. Um, and I'm not sure. Is, is there any way to move forward with it without legislation? Is there a way that this change can occur outside of the, how the political machinery wants to go its own pace, really struggles with intersecting when a change needs to occur? And you just get on with it and make the change anyway? Well, I think in some ways people are getting on with it in, in terms of, we'll say, uh, Oh, the local farmers markets and well, they're doing probably better overall than they they have you know for years and years. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the Frederick market, for example, I see customers coming in or, or consumers coming in looking for local food, mm. but they're never sure how to identify local food. Mm -hmm. And that's that was one of the, 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 the you know the parts of the bill that would clearly identify what's locally produced. And you have customers that have good intentions and they want to support local agriculture yeah. and the local economy. Yeah. But how do you know if this is local or not? So I just had a funny thought, the way we all struggle with peeling all the little stickers off the fruit and everything. Yeah. <laughs> it's like if you came up with your own sticker and... <laughs> well, and that's exactly it. So that's one of the things, like the NFU has been working on a local food strategy with different governments for the past seven years. Yes. Um, and that is the one biggest thing that we're asking for that has not yet come to fruition is a labeling system that doesn't just identify local, but specifically identifies New Brunswick produced foods. Um, and obviously there can be problems with that, but I think if you go to the grocery store and you see a New Brunswick produced food, for a lot of folks that will be their primary, hmm. would be, might be their primary choice. But then there's nothing to say that we can't have a Nova Scotia produced and a PEI produced so that folks are still supporting our region, but we just have that one more step of knowledge mm -hmm. as to yeah. where, and it's happening in larger cities. There's, um, a, and this is another really interesting intersection in terms of economic development. There are tech companies that are creating technology so people can scan on their restaurant menu on their smartphone and yeah. it'll take them back to the website of the farmer who produced that meat that they're eating or those carrots that they're eating with their, their menu. Yeah. Um, and so there are ways of connecting it and and I think people are more and more curious. So it would be really nice to have, a. that's what we've been kind Even of asking for. for, is a concrete step towards realizing this goal. Mm -hmm. More thoughts? Uh, what you just described made me think of some of those ads I've seen where there's a picture of a fish and they've put a, a barcode on the fish and then people will scan it to mm -hmm. find out where the fish came from, that sort of thing. The, uh, Wander in then to not just the legislation, but where you think the union and New Brunswick's version of it needs to go. Um, there's how do we get more young people involved in seeing it as a career? I was at a community meeting just last Saturday, and the, when we do the vision thing, what do you want for the province for the next four years? Everyone, more jobs, more jobs. Someone mentioned farming, and I couldn't help but interrupt and ask, do you connect farming with more jobs? Because people think jobs, they think IT or industry. They don't always slide to farming as a job. Well, I, I think when the when government did its uh, consultation, uh, one of the things that came up at the top of the list was yep. was farming and yep. agriculture. And I don't think people see that as a, uh, a dead end, but they've got to have the impression that it's realistic. Is and, it and it can be realistic, I think, but, they've, they, but we've got to work on that. As a, the NFU, I think, has to, hmm. to uh, demonstrate or, or show that it can be a realistic uh, occupation in the future. Is it taught anywhere in the school systems? You know, where they have apprenticeship programs and they funnel the trades or they've got Not IT, really anymore, no. But there's a gap yeah. there, isn't there? There's a gap, and we don't even have in New Brunswick any post-secondary in agriculture. So our biggest resource is uh, Dal, the Dal Agricultural College in Truro. Okay. So Anglophone students go there. Francophone students will go as far as Guelph or, even in, or Quebec for, for training in their language. So uh, there's definitely a gap in agricultural post-secondary as well. Yeah, um, I don't see that as such a problem. It's been that way a long time, that gap. We did have a community college program for a while, yeah. um, but I think what we have to do is, uh, at a local level maybe, uh, for example, the Europeans have apprenticeship programs. Mm. You might go to school part of the time and then you, just like you'd learn a trade, and yes, you learn to do it properly from the ground up. Yes. <laughs> and I think ACORN has tried to do that to a certain degree, but we need more encouragement for that kind of thing and recognition of it as well. 
Acorn is a lovely movie. I remember attending one of their meetings two years ago in Fredericton. It was, the movie was How to Grow a Farmer. Mm. Yes, I, I've seen it. Yeah. yeah, it was lovely. So if you can go online, go YouTube, and try to find How to Grow a Farmer, you'll see some uh, another version of what to grow and how to grow it. <laughs> yeah. A profession, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, so what's next for you guys? So the Local Food Security Act kind of stumbled in the legislature because they kind of didn't get it and its immediacy. Well, the, the government has made a, a commitment that they're going to continue working on this and hopefully I think the NFU would like to be involved with that process mm -hmm. to, uh, to present our perspective and uh, if the government does come up with something, uh, something that's going to um, meet some of the objectives that we have. So I think we'd be happy to participate in that and help move it along. Mm, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a promise by uh, Minister Doucette at the rally itself that by fall there would be a, a, a strategy in place by the current government. Um, so we have uh, sent another letter expressing our interest to be a part of that process. Mm. We haven't heard anything back yet, um, but we, uh, we hope to be around the table. Uh, it's an interesting conversation to have and yes it was a hiccup they didn't uh, pass this legislation as it was but mm -hmm. with all of the coverage that it received I really hope that that door is just mm -hmm. opened uh, and the discussion is now open and I think it's going to be a bit harder to push it away or pretend that people mm -hmm. aren't interested. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the political angle we've worked on a little bit. What are the other areas that you see as uh, on the horizon for the union? in the short term. You'd mentioned about access to market and there's one desk where the buying happens. That must be sort of an obstacle. Well, that's an obstacle and it's a really tough one to get around. Uh, storage for, uh, to extend our season for winter vegetables and so on. Uh, there's, a lack of, there's lack of infrastructure, I guess, is what it comes down to. And what's okay. happened over the last 20 years is there's been a constant downsizing of uh, infrastructure in terms of everything from processing facilities to slaughterhouse facilities, um, right, right. Um, machinery dealerships, uh, all these things. And it makes it more and more difficult. You have a, a tractor breakdown, well, where do you get your parts? Right. You know, it becomes more, it, you can get them. F thankfully, we have courier services now and so on. Hmm. But it does make uh, life in that area a little tougher. Um, I think another area we have to look at more closely is uh, protection of farmland and access to farmland too. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be an issue that may become more important in the future, especially if you want to grow the industry. S sometimes when you're uh, reading newspapers, you'll get stories mainly from out west about other countries and multinational corporations buying up farmland because the country can't feed itself, so they'll buy the farmland in Canada and work it and ship it there. New Brunswick, uh, are we on anyone's radar or map for that yet? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, we are. So the NFU out of our national office in Sask Saskatchewan, they produced a report called Losing Our Grip 2015, and it's available on the NFU.ca website. Um, and so it looks at farmland grabbing all across the country. So it breaks it down in terms of which companies are the most involved and how much land they own, etc. But then it also does a provincial breakdown. Um, and New Brunswick is on there. There are uh, retirement pension plans and uh, different mm. types of foreign investment, particularly interest farmland in New Brunswick. Um, for folks in New Brunswick may not be incredibly affordable, but compared to the rest of the country, it's definitely at an accessible price. Mm. So looking at a long-term investment is what folks are doing. So we're, that would be another angle that the NFU is, is uh, beginning to do yeah. more research on and uh, a land use policy. Um, that also includes provision on land ownership. Hmm. Which then also must buffer or touch into the recent Crown Lands al woodlot allocation. Does any of that impact on farmland? Because I'm thinking of water runoff and uh, cutting too close to streams and losing arable land. Does, does that come, or is I'm I reaching too far to well, try to I don't to think you're reaching those? too far. A, a lot of farmers have woodlots and so on as well. So it, it yeah. does impact them in that sense because uh, you know a lot of farms are diversified and traditionally in the winter they did more of their woods work and so on in the summer more crop production so yeah. mm -hmm. it's an issue for sure. Yeah. And well exactly what you're saying a farm that I used to work at um, their property backs onto crown land and it was clear cut and by the next year a stream that had been there uh, his entire life so the 50 years that he had been living yeah. on that land had dried up. Um, so it does, it, does, it does affect watersheds and water flow and if uh, a farm is banking on the stream or a underground spring uh, as part of their irrigation or water strategy then I think that can be 
an mm -hmm. effect. But I agree with Ted also in that it's uh, often secondary income. It's the winter. It can be winter work rather than just uh, affecting their agri agricultural land. Yeah. So what's what's the top thing you two would like to see for farming in New Brunswick? What what's where are we going to go? How are we going to make it better? Well, that's a tough question. There's so many Is different areas you can go into. I mean, okay. you know, we've, we've touched on the marketing already. Um, yeah. uh, and the youth. We've touched on infrastructure. Youth. We've touched on youth. But I, I think one of the things we have to be aware of is that we've lost a lot of our research cap capability in the province. Yes. We had a research station up in Kent County, for example. And you've got to, if you're going to grow tree fruits or, or, or berries or grain or whatever, you've actually got to conduct research on the ground in the area that you're working. Um, a, a, a grain that grows well in Saskatchewan isn't necessarily going to grow well down here. Yep. And so you need to have that research capacity. And I think a lot of that research capacity should take place on farms rather than actually at a research station because on a farm it's more realistic the way the crop is actually going to be handled. So I think that's you know something we should be considering. So did we used to have that infrastructure and is it dwindled away or is it we something? Did, we had more infrastructure in the past and it's gradually uh, downsized, yeah. And yeah. what would that infrastructure be? Is it, is it well, uh, NRC those, stuff? It would be uh, it would be Ag research Canada? farms and so on, and Canada, where they would it'd be a research farm uh, where they would actually do crop trials and so on. Yeah. Okay. And in that work would then help the local area farmers with um, soil composition. Well, types it was, of it was seed. even types of seed and so on, that that kind of thing. And uh, I mean, there's still some of that work going on, but it's something that is has diminished for sure, and a lot of it's gone into more private hands. Mm. Yeah, I think we need more public involvement in that area. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, it, is, it is a public benefit. I mean, mm. yeah. other areas to grow for the farmers union. So vis, vis, um, sorry, I'm cutting you off. I want it to be part of the conversation. I want it to be part of the mix mm -hmm. when someone sits down and talks about the economy. Right on the top of their mind is you guys. Well, so. That's that's exactly it. I've been participating a lot in these strategic program reviews, and and it seems to be exactly that opposition where it's like business and agriculture, and I think yeah, in a lot of people's minds, agriculture is not seen as a business. But every one of our farms, they're well, according to the 2011 census, 2,600 people reported farm income tax in the province. So whether or not it's a hobby, hobby farm or full-time employment, that's a lot of people in agriculture. That's a lot of businesses. That's a lot of mm. income generated. And many of those farms employ local people for whether it's all year round or seasonally. Um, and so beginning to dialogue with um, farmers, not just as someone who works the soil and works out in the field, but as business owners mm. and looking at different ways of providing supports um, as business owners, but also in counting those businesses more and more into our economic strategy. Yeah, I, I think, I think the, the province and the government has to, to look at the whole economy and, and not put all their eggs in one basket, so to speak. In other words, I, you know, we're going to push IT or I remember uh, 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 quite a few years ago now that for tourism, they're going to push New Brunswick's nightlife. Well, nobody goes to New Brunswick with nightlife, really. Um, yeah. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Diversify. In other words, yeah, we're, we're a resource-based economy. Let's do that, but let's try to get as much as we can out of resources. Yes. Which means we have to process them and as much as possible make you other uses of them before we, we ship them out. Yeah. Um, tourism. That, that can be a big part of our economy, and farming can, or agriculture can, can contribute to that. You don't want to have a drive through province. You want to be able to, to see that as you drive through the province that there's some scenic areas. Yeah. If you go through Quebec, for example, you can pick up local products all along the way there if you're a tourist. Yeah. There are things that are unique to that province. Um, if you go to Europe, you can do the same thing. Yeah. Now, Brunswick, uh, we could do the same thing. We're, we're, you know, we're one of the largest producers in the world of maple syrup, for example. Yeah. Uh, we've got uh, all kinds of opportunities there to have diversified products that people want to buy, that people want to sample in restaurants, and that people maybe want to take home with them. Yep. Cheese production, whatever. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, interesting in terms of numbers and actual business, um, there's a lot of talk in the local food economy or local, buying local push that we see in all sectors right now um, about the 10% shift. If we all could just shift 10% of our spending locally, like what? economic impact would that have mm -hmm. immediately mm -hmm. um, and 
So in New Brunswick, according to the 2011 StatsCan numbers, um, New Brunswickers spent a billion, 95 million dollars on food and non-alcoholic beverages. So that's a big industry. So if we're looking at shifting just 10%, yeah. that's going to be over a hundred million dollars yeah. in direct return. So that's not including how many extra jobs are created per, or how much more infrastructure is developed and built or like Ted was talking about upstream and downstream jobs. So input um, companies or farm machinery repair companies or that kind of stuff. So that would be over $100 million with just a 10% shift. And when you break that down even further, um, also, for, well, 2013 is the most recent household level of stats that uh, Stats Canada provides, mm -hmm. and they say that the average household spends six thousand eight hundred and fifty-three dollars on groceries a year. Okay. So if we yeah, break that down, that's about thing. thirteen dollars a week that every New Brunswick family would have to shift to buying local food for that economic benefit to take place. Like it, we're really talking a small amount of money per individual, yeah. um, but that could have a huge impact. On small act on a large scale has a huge consequence mm -hmm. or a huge impact. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there a measure of what's already spent um, by New Brunswick people on New Brunswick food? Because that was a measure of a shift. So if we can shift it that 10%, then here's the consequence. Is there a, a measure of where where you are right now? And well, we could, could probably figure it out. We just have to. Yeah. If. It's okay. It's not, yeah. No, it's not broken down. Like, Stats Canada doesn't generate that information. And like Ted was saying, in lack of research, the, there is lack of uh, technical research, yes. but there's also lack of, of r research. Sure. Um, in, so I, Again, it's because it's not on the radar. And how fascinating that food isn't kind of in, in the radar. When listening to some of your story, what crosses the mind is like, oh, wouldn't they have fun if they could get access to as much discretionary spending from the government as industry does, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, <laughs> it, it's interesting. I, I first came down the province in 74, I guess, and all below Fredericton along the St. John River, there's all kinds of vegetable farms through there. Yeah. And there's virtually yeah. nothing left there anymore. And that's yeah. really very productive land, but what happened to it all? Yeah. It, it, was, it was all geared to local consumption. But that's all, virtually all has disappeared in, mm. in what, 30 or 40 years. Mm. Well, and one thing that I also find interesting from that business perspective, I was reading an article, and I feel like it was Bathurst, but I could be wrong, um, and that has a system or a bought an agency set up to help small businesses with succession plans um, and n recognizing that they want to get their local young people to stay in the area mm. and mm. so they're mm. connecting people in high schools and they're connecting mm. them to do internships with these local businesses that ha do not have a succession plan so they're when the business when that person goes to retire the business would likely close um, and I and it just struck me as really interesting that there's I, I don't know, I haven't called them, so maybe farming is, farms are included as businesses in this transition, but I think a larger kind of model where succession can take place, because now if, if you don't have a child who wants to take over the farm, yeah. there's not really a particular um, option of connecting with another youth that is interested in taking that over, and I shouldn't even say youth, new farmer. Yeah, they might yeah. not necessarily yeah. be a youth. Um, but so some kind of succession planning mm -hmm. mechanism mm -hmm. would be a really helpful thing yeah. to get some of those farms that maybe are just sitting idle right now, but do definitely have the potential to and, come and back. quite often a farmer may not want to quit, he just wants to s slow down and start downsizing. <laughs> well, if there was somebody, some Help. way of bringing somebody else into it to start growing into the farm, uh, that yeah. would be a way of uh, keeping that land open for the future. Yeah. There was a story out of Greece during the International Monetary Fund's austerity measures mm -hmm. in Europe, da, 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 all that stuff, of uh, young people living in Athens re recognizing they don't have an opportunity there and started going back to abandoned farms and reclaiming them and getting them to go again. And that was the feature of the story. So a five to seven year window, oh, young people move to the city, all this stuff, there's nothing here for me. I'm going to go back, and they were enriched, they had purpose, they were doing something that nurtured and took care of land. It was a whole massive shift um, spiritually for those young people from where they thought they were going to go to where they went. Yeah. Do we, do we have the same window of opportunity in Little New Brunswick for something similar? Um, I, I think a lot of it starts way back at the 
the, was it a high school level or even before that, and maybe you know, within families and so on, because uh, we constantly have this feeling in Brenza we've got to leave the province even to make a living anymore. <laughs> you know, you, yes. it's not just farming, you've got to leave the province. Well, media constantly pounds us with exactly. that. Exactly, and yeah. even when they go on about New Brunswick's aging population, you look at our stats, how, what our average population number is compared to the other provinces, but we're talking maybe a year's difference or two years difference. It's not like we're geriatric or anything. There you go. But we keep playing the same themes. You can't make a living in farming, you can't make a living in New Brunswick, you've got to leave the province. And uh, I think what we've got to start doing is saying, look, there's opportunities here, and we're, and as a government, we're willing to back some local people. Because one thing about backing a farmer, he can't, it's not like a call center, he can't pick it up <laughs> and, and move to the cheapest labor uh, that's available in another province or another country. Yeah, if you invest in a farm and you, you put some infrastructure in, it's going to stay, it's not going to, it's yeah. not on wheels. There's a whole different feeling to it. Yeah. And on that, we're going to take a brief pause. We're going to pause for just a few moments. We'll be back shortly. Mile marker, mile marker, count them off, son. Between what once was and what's begun. Okay, we're back, and I'd like to start with a story. When we were off camera earlier, you told the story about uh, driving down to Nova Scotia and back, and you had a uh, guest with you in your car. Can you retell that story? Sure. Um, so I travel a lot, and I mostly offer r rides on rideshare. So rideshare is just a common forum where I write, I'm going to Halifax on this day, and people can write me back and say, sure, I want to ride with you. Um, and one of the people I ended up taking uh, was from India, and he's been in uh, Halifax for two years and in New Brunswick now for one and on the way back he said he caught, stopped the conversation and said but you don't grow vegetables in New Brunswick or in Canada and I said what what, what do you mean of course I'm driving and I'm a little shocked and I can't look back at him yeah. and he says no but you don't know grow vegetables here and I was oh what, why do you think that and he said well when I go to the grocery store everything is from California or everything is from Chile there's no vegetables here from from Canada and, I, and then we're driving on Highway 2 from Halifax back up, and we go, yeah, the Highway 2 is designed that you don't really see farms. And if you do, you might see a field of cattle, but you don't necessarily see those vegetable farms. So for me, that was very poignant uh, in terms of how our economy not only is perceived by other people, but that's probably a better, an accurate assessment of reality. Yeah. I live in Fredericton. I've lived there for many years, and so I know that if I want my local food, I would go to the... Boys Farmers Market on the weekends, or there's more and more options opening up for midweek purchases yeah, as well. St. John constantly has their market on the go. Moncton has a huge, now thriving mm -hmm. um, farmers market for the, for those centers. But the reality is, is most people still, even though the farmers markets are thriving and more and more are opening up every season, yeah. uh, most people buy their groceries um, at the grocery store. And yeah. if uh, I think we've got to make it more convenient for them because a farmers markets, I really like. I like farmers markets. I've been there for years, and I like the atmosphere and yeah. the products you can get there. Mm -hmm. But it's tough for a customer, if, uh, a consumer, if they're trying to purchase all they need for a family, just for parking, getting it to you know yep. from the market to the to the uh, um, car and so on. And there's got to be easier ways for the consumer yeah. as well. Yeah, and then there's the whimsy element. You know, there's some people who get groceries every two, three days because they're kind of figuring out where they're going to cook two days from now yeah. or three days from now. So, so there's some of that. Is there, a, which then means, how do you get a local section into the big, bigger stores? Do they ever open that up? Do they ever identify it? Um, I think I saw something in the media two months ago about one of the food chains saying they will create a local food section at the end of an aisle so that you would know in the produce section that when you walk over here, you're going to find New Brunswick grown product. Did, no, it's not resonating, so it's not ringing any bells. I, uh, no, actually, I did hear some announcement like that. But it but didn't I, have an impact for you or f through the... No, well, it, it was too early to tell, but I, I guess my feeling is too often those things are, are tokens and that's all they are. Um, uh, it's got to be more than a little section. You've got to actually have product there and have it fresh uh, and where people can see and access it and it doesn't get stale. Yeah. You know. It's, yeah. It takes it takes a real commitment, I think. Yeah. Which then ties the, that for me is the counterbalance to those people who take the time to go to the farmers market or stop at the local food stand, and then those that would go to the bigger stores. Um, where's the, where's the co-op in this mix? 
the different co-ops around? Are they more like the big big stores, or are they manage to blend buying locally or buying within the province? I, I would say, and I'm not an expert in co-ops, but I would say they're better than big stores, but they're more like the big stores. In other words, uh, they still did most of their buying through central desk, but there was some avenues to get into the co-ops. They were a little more, I think, a little, somewhat more open to it, and, mm -hmm. and it probably depended on the co-op as well. They were a little more independent. Yeah. In, in that sense, I, I think uh, with the demise of the co-op marketing side of things, we, you know, we've lost, you know, to a certain degree, another opportunity. But uh, they weren't um, purchasing as much as I'd like to see purchased. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And there was a recent announcement too. I was just reminded that Atlantic Co-op has been bought by one of the. Well, that's what I was referring to. That warehouse is it will be uh, handled by Sobeys now, and there won't be any Atlantic Co-op anymore in terms of that kind of product. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So the obstacles aren't just the weather, which we could slide into about weather changes and growing, or but it's also some infrastructure, but the bureaucratic infrastructure and within the private yeah, I, side. Yeah. Weather, the weather in our local land base is on. That's not the obstacle, I don't think. Okay. Uh, you go anywhere in Canada, and if you're in southern Ontario, you got great land, but it's also extremely expensive land. Okay. You got lots of market opportunities, but you've also got the big uh, box stores and the big systems. I don't think it's land. I don't think it's uh, um, weather. Um, I think it's more infrastructure and uh, th those kinds of opportunities. So, if I interpret that a different way, we have all we need. We just don't put it together very well. The things that could be fixed are all the pieces fixed of the puzzle. Humans. All the pieces of the puzzle are laying out here on the table, yep. but they're not put together. That's the problem right now. Mm -hmm. And those are things that humans do because nature has given us the location yeah. and the environment and yeah. Uh, Interesting. No, I mean, if you look at the uh, fruit production again, we can pr we can produce all the apples we'll ever eat in this province, but we don't. Mm. Uh, it's pr fruit production. You know, it can be tricky sometimes, but uh, we've got the climate side actually changes. It's probably getting better for fruit production than it has been. Yes. And uh, but we're still uh, we're fighting uh, you know cold storage issues, access to market issues. There was a I, I can't recall the name of the orchard now, but in uh, just outside of St. Andrews, there's an orchard that had been there for 50, 75 years. And they used to sell to uh, uh, stores in, in, in St. John and, and St. Stephen and so on. Hmm. And they lost their access to most of those stores. And eventually they started selling at local farmer's market. That's not a big enough market for them. And eventually it went under. It went under. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's it's that forward thinking and it's looking to the future because a fruit tree coming into production is going to take three to seven years depending on the type and how it was grafted and all of that good stuff so it, it is a long-term investment um, and so being able to have access to that kind of up-and-coming market research and that up-and-coming training so that folks are able to start planning transitioning their farms to to different Hmm. Uh, perhaps a different variety of apple or a different crop or expanding that instead of uh, getting caught with oh, a market change and or a climate change and now whatever that had been functioning so well is no longer working so I think and this comes to me often when I think of farms as businesses and successful businesses um, they're always looking for new opportunities and oh well we traditionally don't like Tim Tim Hortons like Terrible example, but everyone knows what Tim Hortons <laughs> is, right? Like it used to be coffee and donuts. Yeah. And then there was now there's a need for muffins, and then bagels became a big thing, and now there's yeah. bagels, and now there's iced coffees, and then those coffees more like the Starbucks or the Second Cup because people are starting to ask for more of the specialty coffee. So yeah. they're adapting with the times, and yeah. and obviously it's it's a different thing to adapt when you're not in primary production and you're not in Canada where you only have one one go a year to mm. to make those changes, mm. but um, yeah. I think, yeah, the research, it really comes back to down to that research component and having that information available and saying, yeah. Do we have, uh, the cliche would be the potato. So do we have a crop that signifies the province that could be symbolic? So because of the impact of McCain in the agribusiness model, it tends to be that, but that's not what you're speaking to. I think we got to be careful of that model because the, the potato is a commodity. Yeah. And wherever you can produce that potato, the cheapest, is where it's that's gonna where it's go. going to be produced. Yep. And you're, um, and we're, and that may be based upon labor. It may be based upon a whole lot of other things, access to cheaper fertilizer, whatever. Yep. 
uh, McCain's, they have uh, plants in, in China, uh, uh, Belgium, Britain, France, uh, yeah. South America, the States, all over. Yeah. Uh, if we follow that model, it's a risky model, and it, it might succeed, but again, um, a place like Oregon, they produce a tremendous number of apples. Uh, California, they produce probably half of what the U.S. consumes in, in, in vegetables. Yeah, but California, well, yes. But they're going, they, through, they're, they're, they're going through stresses yeah. right now. Oh, but I guess what, I, what I'm getting at is, yes, is that's a dangerous model in some ways to produce. I don't think we should forget about exporting at all. I think the, the, the Department of Agriculture is very wise to continue pushing exports. Mm -hmm. Let's push replacement as well of imports. That's yeah. what we should be doing as well because okay. it's very diversified. If we replace a lot of things that are Im imported from right from lamb to uh, um, cherries, uh, we're, go we're going to we diversify it so we have a crop failure in one area or one commodity becomes becomes commodified and becomes very cheap. Yeah. We've got a whole lot of other things to fall back upon. Yeah. And that's such a key point so I'm glad you brought it up. And where I was trying to slide over was a bit about the provincial narrative, its connection to farming, and how do we shift away from the potato as the identifier in New Brunswick to maybe it's um, what you described indirectly, which was the general food basket. So is there a way for, you know how New Brunswick's not known in the rest of Canada, <laughs> you yeah. know? Well, the, so is there something that farming can help us reclaim our identity? It ties us to where we're from, our roots, literally. It feeds us. And it can also become part of our identity. I, I don't know about, I, I think it can become part of it. it. It can make for a richer cultural environment, let's put it that way, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, again, I'm gonna use Quebec as an example because I, I think they are a great example in certain ways. Um, Quebec's got a strong agricultural economy, mm -hmm. but do you identify Quebec with, um, I don't know, potatoes, no. Yeah, other than Putin, but yeah, <laughs> I just they, no, they're, no, no, they're st they're strong in a number of areas. They've got yes. local cheeses. They've got a strong dairy industry. They've got a strong Cheese, pork industry. Corn. They produce beef, yeah. uh, fruits. Um, so uh, diversified, uh, very diversified. Way. Okay, and a lot of that food is processed locally and is specialized. So you think of Quebec agriculture, you think of as a you think of as something that's interesting, yes. a place I'd like to visit and maybe partake of. Yeah, I might like to stop at that store along the way and pick out some different cheeses that I can't get anywhere else. Yep. Oka, for example. Yes. Um, yes. And if if you think of a province like New Brunswick, we're just going to put everything into potatoes. Well, that's not very interesting. Yeah. Now, if it's potatoes and it's cranberries and and fruit and wine and, and uh, cider and so on. Okay, now it's starting to get interesting. Yep. And we can piggyback that onto a whole lot of other things. Mm -hmm. So do we have some of those elements already in place? Oh yeah, uh, take pickaroons. I mean, everybody's heard of pickaroons, the microbrewery industry. Yeah. Uh, we've got at least two companies I can think of that make apple cider, hard apple cider right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got, I'm not sure how many, but there's a number of cheese companies. Um, a, a good example would be Armadale. Uh, they're a dairy. Uh, uh, da they're dairy farmers. Uh, they, they're part of the milk marketing board. Their the milk goes through that system, but they also produce uh, high-quality yogurt, cheeses, and so on, that are sold not only at the farmers market but also sold in some individual stores and so on. Mm. So that's a value-added industry. I don't know what they do in terms of employment for people, but uh, there's got to be people working for them. Mm. Mm -hmm. And our winery industry is increasing. There, the. NB Wineries has a uh, brochure. When I last had it, it was already a few years old, but there were about 20 wineries identified, and that's just tying in the tourism. A lot of them do a bed and breakfast or wine tours or a dinner on site where you can come sample wine and, mm -hmm. and enjoy it in that way. Um, I, do, I think there's a lot of opportunity for diversifying, mm -hmm. and I think, and part of it is a cultural shift, and I think that's maybe possibly traditionally, uh, Francophone culture has a stronger more visible tie to food. Um, that's why f France, they're known for food all around the world. Yes. Even Quebec tends to be known for, for high quality food, mm -hmm. um, celebrating around food. And I think you know, New Brunswick is a, one third of our population is Francophone. And maybe that's a really strong element of the Francophone culture that can be permeated back through the rest of the province. Um, not only to celebrate food and bring community, but also we are one of the obesest provinces in the country. <laughs> like, if we can celebrate food and start having it be a positive shared event um, where people celebrate and feel good about eating and take time to cook in family and, yeah. and uh, um, yeah, celebrate eating, then I think, I, think, <laughs> I think, for me personally, I think food is just such a cultural underpinning. Everything we do has to do 
with food. It's the one activity most people engage in about three times a day, if not more. <laughs> yep, yep. You're speaking to, I can already see the sound clips coming out now, or the video clips, because Levi Lawrence, when he was on from Real Food Connections, got very animated about that same theme, mm -hmm. that if people would just take more time, I've got these tick boxes, Dennis, so if you spend more m of your money, 10% more on local food, <coughs> if you spend more time cooking it together, if you spend more time talking together, a lot of these social ills that we're trying to address will be taken care of through food. And Penny Erickson on the uh, healthcare strategy would talk about if we just ate better, we could deal with all our rising healthcare costs if we would smarten up a little bit and eat a bit better. And you represent the very intersection where that all can happen and trying to get that part of the provincial conversation mm -hmm. somehow, some way. Where are we going to go in the future with farming? What's your, what's your golden view of, of what we need in the first three or four years? Or and then 20 years from now? Well, I wish I was about 30 or 40 years younger. <laughs> because I think, no, I think, I think you know, if, if climate change is, is real, I think it is, uh, yeah. we're going to see uh, um, more opportunities in New Brunswick as the climate becomes a little warmer sure. and a little less, and it doesn't feel like this past winter, but overall, the climate is uh, not as um, uh, difficult to deal with as it was in the past, I don't think, at least not in terms of temperatures. So do we shift from a uh, zone five, if I have that right, to a zone four? Would, would that be the uh, shift? It's possible. I know grape zones and so on are shifting. Okay. Uh, and places like California that are presently, the, the not the bread basket, but the vegetable basket in North America, that's going to shift as well because yes. there, there, is, there are changes in, the wa in, in water access and so on. Yep. So I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities out there. Yeah, and, um, and we need the ability to feed ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think last winter, every every time we've had some kind of weather event, that's what their media is calling them now, weather events, over the past year, whether it was a winter storm or Arthur last year, there's a power outage, shores are, stores are shutting down, transport's unable to happen, food is getting wasted. That's We're really fortunate that up until now, they haven't been so extreme where there's been loss of life or things like that. But I think they're all, for me personally, they're all just really strong reminders about the major flaws in our current system and just little nudgings of, we, these are all opportunities for us to become stronger, more resilient. Mm -hmm. And that goes right back to that, the food security or the food sovereignty terms that we were talking about. If you're financially secure, you know you've got backup. You know you've got it in different places. You don't have, again, like Ted said, all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. So to making 95% of our food come from imports and have to travel long distances um, that are all weather dependent it just seems very, yep. very there, there's foolish a, to tie, me. Yes, tied to that is, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the things I hear is there's roughly a three-day food supply in the grocery store. So if a storm hits, like in Arthur, and the store can't be restocked, there's roughly three days worth in there. And then everyone's kind of on their own for what they can do for food sources. Yeah, I, I've heard that figure. I don't know exactly what it is. I'm sure it is a limited supply for certain certain things. Mm -hmm. But what I find really uh, sort of interesting and, in, in, um, I don't know, ridiculous at the same time <laughs> is that a lot of food is moved around yes. for no purpose at all. I've, I've seen figures where, for example, Britain exports uh, X number of tons of lamb every year. And we'll say it was 100,000 tons of lamb every year. But they import 100,000 tons of lamb every year as well. And what's happening is people are taking advantage of, there's a little higher price over in this market, so we, we take advantage of that market. This is the traders. And there's a, a lower price here. We can pick it up here. And they're just moving food around all the time. And when you look at how far product, you know, grapes come from Chile now. I mean, yeah, it's, it's not sustainable in the long run. Yeah, back to your rideshare person. That, that goes to the grocery store and sees the labels and how did that get here from there. I think there was a story in the media recently about some person finding a type of bug, a dangerous. Oh, scorpion. Yeah, yeah I heard that on coming down, yeah. Some lettuce or yeah. something, which uh, then slides to how do we get people to wake up? Because it sounds like the difference is the buyer, the consumer being more aware of their choices, those many small acts, but on a large scale. How, how do we nudge that so that we have that sovereignty within the province where people are buying that 10% more that you're talking about? I, I, think, it, I think it's a false choice sometimes. Uh, consumers think they have choices, but they're very, <laughs> it's a false choice. Uh, because they go to the, the, the cereal section of the, the, of the, the supermarket, hmm. 
there may be 50 different cereals there, but they're all essentially the same thing. Yeah, it's just all, like and media and too. And they, there might be, a, a, I don't know how many different brand names there, but they come down to about three companies. Yes. Um, so how much real choice is there? Or if you, uh, if you go to the, the vegetable section, you go to buy carrots, well, they're all, uh, you know, this coarse, machinable, uh, harvested uh, carrot that's uh, traveled, uh, you know, a thousand miles and has no taste to it and yes. has started losing its nutritional value. Mm-hmm. Or if you buy apple juice, yeah. unless you look at the small print, it was made from apple concentrate, it's probably been shipped in from China. Yeah. And, then you, and then you've got to start looking at things like, we've got a certain set of food standards here in terms of the things that we can use on our uh, crops and so on in terms of uh, uh, insecticides and herbicides yeah. and so on. And we're, we're limited in what we can use. Um, what are the standards in other, uh, other countries? How much of it is tested when it comes in? Uh, yeah. A few years ago, honey uh, became an issue. Uh, honey became very expensive in Canada because most of our honey was exported, or sorry, imported, imported yeah. from uh, China at that yes. point, and they were using an antibiotic on it. Americans were the ones that discovered the fact. Yep. And then we quit uh, importing honey for about a year. Yeah. There's um, a lovely story that ran through the Facebook world about a family that went on to uh, organic food for two weeks and mm-hmm. they did a blood analysis at the beginning and a blood analysis mm-hmm. at the end and it was stunning on the graph of how much of the uh, unseen and unknown pesticides, insecticides, chemicals that were in the food chain. We have about four or five minutes left. Um, there was another story through the internet world about ugly vegetables. So some stores actually put a bin out where it wasn't the perfect tomato or the perfect mm-hmm. carrot. Mm-hmm. It was the, the goofy looking one and they sold them for 10% less and it was constantly empty. Mm-hmm. It, people went there. Yeah. Have you run into that? Have we started doing that in New Brunswick yet? I've done you? it before. But I've had <laughs> ugly carrots, for example. I said the ugly carrots, so I put a sign of ugly carrots. I sold them for the same price. Uh, <laughs> and okay. they all went. Yes. Yeah. They, you know, people use them for stews and, and soups and so on. Sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. I pretty much nobody eats a carrot like, you know, Bugs bu- Bunny. Bug, bu- <laughs> like Bugs Bunny. So, really, it doesn't matter what your shape your carrot is, in my mind. Yeah, because exactly. Because yeah. I know so few people who actually just bite off the end of the carrot and start chomping away. Like, yeah. And that, that's one great thing about processing food. If you process food in the province, it takes care of that ugly stuff, like apples. Yes. When you make apple cider, it doesn't have to be a perfect apple. Yes, yes. If you're going to uh, mm-hmm. um, take your uh, f- um, potatoes and turn them into something else, it doesn't have to be a perfect potato. We don't need a perfect potato for, uh, even as a farmer selling on the fresh market, and then if there's a way to get rid of your, your product that could be processed, yep. fine. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I think all of that goes back to addressing food insecurity, um, households on tight budgets. And, and there are really interesting stats, although I don't have the numbers fresh in my mind right now, about... Uh, the n- amount of food waste and a lot mm-hmm. of it comes before st- food even gets into the yes. uh, sales area, sales arena. It's already discarded because yeah. it doesn't fit that perfect mold. Yeah. So we're producing enough food, it's just n- not all of it is being mm-hmm. recognized yeah. and not all of it is getting to the people who need it. So, uh. <laughs> and, and the consumer has to learn how to prepare food too. Uh, there's a lot of cuts yes. uh, from, from uh, uh, pork or beef or lamb or whatever. They're delicious, but you've got to know how to prepare them. Everything's not going to be a steak. Yeah, food yeah. literacy. Yeah. And as you send us off at the end of the show, you also invite what the next two or four hours of conversation could have been about uh, food waste and food preparation. And so hopefully we'll, you'll come back one day and we'll continue this. Maybe have a panel of some kind because it's an important conversation for the province. Quick closing thoughts that you'd like to leave with the audience? Oh boy, that's tough to summarize everything. But uh, I, I guess, I guess from my point of view, if you're a young person, there's lots of opportunities in farming still. All right, you just got to look for them. All right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, from an eater's point of view, I think there's a lot of opportunities to find really <laughs> interesting, unique, and affordable products grown right here at home. So. Great. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful and powerful conversation. Thank you for watching, and you out there, if you all did one act that bought local um, from a local farmer, it will have an impact on our economy, and you can help the province that way. A lot of people doing a simple act on a large scale can make a difference. As always, be good, have fun, and love each other. Mile, 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 mile.
market, count them off, son. 